Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker sees more than the rest of us. That's not just a metaphor. Neil Harbison has an antenna implanted in his skull that allows him to perceive colors that the human eye normally cannot perceive, such as infrareds and ultraviolets. Neil Harbison is the co-founder of Cyborg Foundation, an organization that promotes the use of cybernetics for human senses and perception. He explains how we can take an active role in the biological evolution of the human body, becoming technology rather than wearing technology. Ladies and gentlemen, Neil Harbison. Okay. Thank you. Well, I was born with an unusual visual condition called achromatism, which means that I'm completely colorblind, so I've never actually seen a color. Blue, yellow, pink doesn't mean anything to me because I've never seen it. So as a child, I tried to ignore the existence of color, but it was impossible for me to ignore color because people who see color, like yourselves, keep mentioning it every single day. Uh, in daily elements such as yellow pages, Bluetooth, Greenpeace, the Red Cross, Pink Panther, James Brown, it's in his last name, or this huge country called Greenland. So I kept hearing the names of color every single day. Also, when you use color as a code, it can be confusing. Hot water, cold water, sometimes it's only expressed through color. Also, when I uh, have maps in front of me, some of them are only based on color. This is fine, but if I go to Tokyo, I can get easily lost, because some maps only use color codes. And when I was trying to learn the colors of flags, I had this situation where three countries share exactly the same flag. Also, when people talk to me, if someone asked me, have you seen a man with ginger hair, blue eyes, and dressed in pink? I would have absolutely no idea, because the only information I get here is that the man has hair, that he has eyes, and that he's not naked, basically. So the reason why I wanted to sense color was because I wanted to have this social element. I didn't want to change my sight. I wanted to keep seeing in grayscale, because seeing in grayscale has many advantages. I have better night vision. I can detect camouflages more easily. Uh, I can see longer distances, because color doesn't interfere with my perception of distance. And photocopies are cheaper in black and white. So this was always an advantage. I didn't want to change my sight, but I wanted to have a sense of color. So when I was studying music, I realized that there's been a, a theory for many centuries relating color and sound. Isaac Newton started this centuries ago. So I wanted to take Isaac Newton's theory into practice. Uh, he said that each color of the rainbow corresponds to a different musical note. And he was right. Uh, color and sound have something in common. They're both frequencies. Color is a light frequency, and sound is an audio frequency. So there is a relationship between them both. Now that we have technology, we can actually hear the frequencies of color. That's what we created uh, in 2003, a system that allowed me to hear the frequencies of red, orange, pink, yellow. So I slowly memorized the sound of the colors around me, and I slowly got to differentiate red from pink from yellow by the frequency of sound. So if you could hear color, you would hear these notes. Now we're hearing it from red to orange. It's extremely microtonal. So I slowly got used to it until I was able to distinguish all the visual spectrum through sound. When I was able to distinguish all the visual spectrum, I didn't see why I should stop there. There's many more colors that exist that the human eye cannot sense, like infrareds and ultraviolets. So I decided to include infrareds and ultraviolets in the system, so I was suddenly able to sense more colors than the human eye. Humans only sense a, a little amount of colors, but there's many more that exist ultraviolets, infrareds, so the antenna now allows me to feel infrareds. If I go into a shop or a bank, I can tell if the alarms are on or off, and in many cases they are off, so it's interesting to know that some of these sensors are not working. Ultraviolet perception allows me to feel if it's a good day or a bad day to sunbathe, and my aim is to continuously extend my color perception to x-rays and to up to radio waves. So when I was doing this, I didn't want to use technology as a tool. I didn't want to use technology to know the colors. I wanted to uh, 
create a new body part. So I didn't want to use or wear technology. I wanted to become technology. First, I thought of creating a third eye, but then I thought maybe the best way would be to design an antenna that would be implanted inside my head, and the antenna would allow me to feel the vibrations of color inside my skull. So when I finished the design of the antenna, I went to the doctor and I said I wanted an antenna implanted in my head. And he said, sorry, we, we don't do antenna implants here. If you want to have an antenna implanted in your head, you'll have to convince a bioethical committee. So I presented the antenna surgery to a bioethical committee, and they said it was not ethical to have this antenna implanted inside my head for three reasons. One, because it's not a pre-existing body part. If it wasn't a leg or an arm, it would be ethical. An antenna is not human, so they didn't find it ethical. The second reason, because it senses infrared and ultraviolets, which is not a human sense, they didn't find it ethical either. And the third reason was that they were extremely worried about the image the hospital would have if someone came out with an antenna sticking out of the head. So they said no to the surgery, but they helped me find a doctor willing to do the surgery anonymously. So we did the surgery. This is my head facing down. So my uh, skin was uh, reduced. And then the head was drilled four times for four different implants. One is the chip that now allows me to feel the vibrations of color inside my skull, so red vibrates, I receive the vibration inside my bone, and then I hear the sound inside my head. Two other implants are to hold the structure of the antenna, and the fourth implant is internet connection, so I can also receive colors from other parts of the world. The antenna and my head took two months to merge, so now the antenna is part of my skeleton, so I'm also officially taller now, because this is part of my body, and I had to get used to this new height. The internet connection, I use it to receive colors from five different people. There's five people in the world that have permission to send colors directly to my head. So now I'm here in Belgium, but if someone from Australia wants to send colors to my head, they can do it uh, online. So they can use their mobile phone and stream live images from anywhere in the world to my head. So I could suddenly be sensing the colors of a sunset in Australia while I'm here. I see this as the use of the internet as a sense. We've been using the internet as a tool or a communication system, but we can start using the internet as a sensory extension or as a sense itself. If they send colors to my head when I'm sleeping, sometimes they wake me up or they can color my dreams. So if someone starts sending uh, red colors when I'm asleep, a ban uh, maybe a, a, a tomato might appear in my dream or my dream just suddenly might become red. So my friends can actually color my dreams or they can alter my dreams if they send colors when I'm sleeping. The internet connection also allows me since 2014 to connect to NASA's International Space Station. When I do this, my sense of color is no longer on Earth, but in space. So internet allows me to explore space. It allows me to send my sense of color in space and explore the colors of space while I'm here. I call this becoming a sensetronaut. Instead of physically traveling to space, we can actually have senses specifically designed to explore space. So instead of having to physically go there, we could all explore space if we had senses in space. I don't see this as an AI project. I see it as an AS project. If the antenna was an artificial intelligence, the antenna would be giving me the names of colors, but I didn't want technology to give me the intelligence. I wanted my brain to develop the intelligence, so that's why I created an AS, an artificial sense. The antenna allows me to sense the vibrations of colors, and then it's up to my brain to create the intelligence or not. So I think we will see many more projects in the future related to artificial senses, and there will be not so much focus now on AI, but there will also be some focus on the creation of artificial senses. If you merge with an artificial sense, the intelligence or the knowledge is created by your brain, not by the machine, or in collaboration with technology. Also, this is not a virtual reality, uh, the reality in which I live now, and it's not an augmented reality. I see it as a revealed reality. Technology is allowing me to reveal a reality that exists, but that the human body cannot sense. Infrareds and ultraviolets are not virtual and are not augmented. It's a reality that exists. We are now surrounded by elements that the human body cannot sense, but technology can allow us to reveal these realities. So I think we will see many projects as well in the future related to revealing realities that already exist, but that the human bodies cannot sense. This is an MRI scan of my brain. I feel no difference between the software and my brain anymore. That's why I define myself as a cyborg, which is 
that I feel that I am technology, and I feel that uh, the technology has become part not only of my identity, but also part of my mind. And that's what I tried to explain to the UK government in 2004, because they said there was a problem with my passport photo. They said I had to remove the electronic equipment. I told them that uh, the antenna is not an electronic equipment. The antenna is a body part. I told them that I am not wearing an antenna. I have an antenna in the same way that I'm not wearing a nose. I have a nose. And the antenna should be considered a body part. In the end, they allowed me to appear in the passport of 2004 with the first antenna prototype. And this allows me to travel freely. I'm now in conversations with the Swedish government because uh, I am telling them that I think that I should be allowed to become Swedish because the materials that I used to create the antenna are Swedish. So I'm telling them that I am Swedish because part of my body is Swedish. So I think that there should be a sixth point here that says that if you have a Swedish body part, you should also be entitled to become a Swedish citizen. I see this as cyborg art or cyborg design, the art of designing your own senses, the art of designing your own body parts, and the art of designing your own perception of reality. We are the first generation that can truly start designing who we want to be as a species. Technology is becoming more biocompatible, it's becoming smaller, and it's becoming cheaper to actually develop these sensors. We've been giving so many sensors to machines for so many decades, now we can start adding these sensors to ourselves so that we can start revealing these realities that surround us. Other cyborg artists I will talk about in a few moments. My life has changed in many ways, like uh, not only daily elements have now a sound, but I can now also dress in a way that it sounds good, because each color creates a note. I can dress in silence, I can dress in uh, A minor, I can dress in C major, I can decide what notes I want to wear, or I can design ties, for example, that sound like electronic music. So when I look at this tie, I hear electronic music. So the longer the tie, the longer the melody. So I can decide how much music I want to wear. Also, there will be soon a, a new a branch in fashion, which will probably be called cyborg fashion, which is uh, accessories or clothes designed for people with new organs and new senses. In my case, I have to redesign hats so that they fit with someone that has an antenna implant. Hats with holes or other elements we will see if people create new organs and new senses. Um, uh, this is also now music for me, so instead of listening to music, I can also paint music. Uh, I can paint what I hear. This is a painting based on Mozart's Queen of the Night. From the middle to the end, I can, like this, just hear the music of Mozart. So this is music to me. This is uh, Mozart's Queen of the Night. And this is Baby Baby by Justin Bieber, which looks very different from Mozart. Also, speeches can be transposed into color, because when we speak, we use different frequencies. So these are two speeches. One is Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream, and the other one is a speech by Hitler. So they look very different because they use very different frequencies. But we all have specific frequencies and specific colors when we speak. This, uh, the experience of food has changed a lot, because when I look at food, I hear different notes. So I can now uh, compose music with food. And this is a project I did with a restaurant where you can go there, and the food is served on a chromophone. This is like a replica of my head. The food is placed on the, on the plate, and then you remove the plate, and you can hear the sound of the food. So you can go there and eat some Vivaldi as main dish, or some Lady Gaga dessert. You can choose which songs you want to eat. I can now compose music by looking at things. No longer need to play an instrument, but by looking at different objects, I can compose music. So my experience of walking around a supermarket has changed completely. To me, going to a supermarket is like going to a nightclub, because there's so much color, so many music uh, aisles, that uh, it's a completely different experience, especially the zone with cleaning products. That's the most exciting area of a supermarket, because it has very unexpected colors. Also, art has changed. I can now listen to a Picasso. I can listen to an Andy Warhol, because all painters have become composers. So I can literally hear the scream, for example, because when I look at the painting, I can hear the colors. So the scream has sound, and each painter has its own uh, melody and its own dominant colors. 
And one of the biggest changes is the way I experience people, because when I look at someone's face, I can hear their face now. So I really enjoy creating sound portraits, where I get close to someone's face, I write down the notes of the eyes, the lips, the skin, the hair, and then I send them an MP3 of their face so they can listen to themselves. One of the first ones I did was of Prince Charles. I asked him if I could listen to his face, and this was his reaction when I asked him. <laughs> we all sound different. Uh, for example, uh, Judy Dench has silent hair. Her hair almost doesn't sound. Uh, James Cameron has a very high-pitched sound of skin. Moby has one note less than other people because he has no hair, so what's one note less? Marina Abramovic sounds very low, low frequencies. Macaulay Culkin sounds C major, so it's unusual to find someone that sounds like a major chord. Uh, Iris Apfel has a very, very high note in her eyes. Uh, Robert De Niro has a melody in his lips because he has different frequencies of red. Uh, Philip Glass sounds extremely microtonal, and Bono had very loud glasses here. So we all have a specific soundscape. What really shocked me is that people who say they're black, they're not black, and people who say they're white, they're not white. People who say they are black, they're actually very, very dark orange, and people who say they're white, they're actually very, very light orange. So the fact that people say that humans are black and white is completely false. We are all orange. This is just an example of uh, the sound of a face. You can create melodies and rhythms with people's faces. I call this face concerts where the audience cues, and then I start creating music, electronic music from the audience's colors. So if the concert sounds really bad, it's not my fault. It's their fault, because that's where the music is coming from. One of the last concerts was of Prince Albert II of Monaco. He likes the sound of his face so much that he's using it as his ringtone. So whenever someone calls him, he hears the sound of his face. So when I started this project in 2003, there were two risks. One was... Uh, had uh, the, the, my body would reject the material, and the second risk was that my brain would reject the sense, but it didn't happen. I had no rejection, but what really changed was the social reaction. I've been stopped every single day in the streets because the antenna is very visible. In 2004, most people thought it was a reading light, so people would ask me if I could turn on the light. In 2005, people thought it was a microphone. In 2007, people thought it was a hands-free telephone. In 2009, people thought it was a GoPro cam that I was filming my life, so people would wave at me. In 2012, 13, many people thought I had something to do with Google Street View and that I was streaming the streets. In 2015, children would ask if this was some kind of selfie stick attached to my head. And in 2016, many people just shouted at me, Pokemon, and they tried to catch me. So it's changed what people think it is. Hopefully in the 2020s, we'll see more people with new organs in the street, and it will become more normalized. Um, sorry, this is... In 2010, I created the Cyborg Foundation with Moon Rivas. So we are creating new senses and new organs in collaboration with people. Moon Rivas uh, has done several projects. She had earrings that allow her to feel movement with her eyes closed. So it's simple earrings that allow you to feel movement without having to use your eyes. It also allows you to sense if there's someone behind you, so it gives you retroception. So with simple earrings, you can sense if there's presence behind you. She also has two implants in her feet that allow her to feel the seismic activity of the world. So whenever there's an earthquake, she feels a vibration in her feet. She's now also connected to the seismic activity of the moon. So whenever there's a moon quake, she feels a vibration in her feet. So she's also a sense thrown out because one of her senses is on the moon. So in the 20th century, we saw how humans went to the moon. On the 21st century, we can see how the moon comes into our bodies. So we can bring the space into our bodies so that we can explore space without having to physically go there. Also, other projects is teeth that create light. I have a tooth missing, so I had a tooth placed so that in case of emergency, I can click and then I have emergency light in my mouth. This is bioluminescence. Many species can create light in total darkness. We can, but with simple implants like this, we can actually create light in total darkness. Another project I did in Brazil was a, a tooth was placed in my mouth, and another tooth was placed inside Moon River's mouth, and whenever I click, she feels a vibration in her mouth, and whenever she clicks, I receive a vibration in my mouth. We both learn the Morse code, so depending on the on the rhythm, we can actually send words to each other and communicate from mouth to mouth. We call this a transcendental communication system, and it was presented in Sao Paulo. So it works. <laughs> it's a communication system that would work in space because there's no air conduction in space or under the water, and it actually works, uh, it actually works through Bluetooth. So it's a Bluetooth tooth that allows you to communicate from mouth to mouth. 
Last year, we created the Transspecies Society. It's a society in Barcelona that gives voice to non-human identities. There's people who do not identify as being 100% human. Some of them uh, are cyborgs. Some of them want to become cyborgs. And we're giving voice to them, and we're creating new organs and new senses. Like uh, Manel Muñoz has a sensor that allows him to feel the weather. So he can feel if it's going to rain or if it's going to be sunny by feeling vibrations in, in, in his head. And we're developing many other senses that many other species have. For thousands of years, we've been a species changing the planet. And I think this is about to change. We've been designing the planet. We've been changing it so that we could survive. And I think this is what is changing right now. We will stop changing the planet. We will stop designing the planet. And we will start changing ourselves and designing ourselves. If instead of changing the light of the planet when it's dark, like using artificial light, we all had night vision, cities would be completely dark. So we wouldn't have to turn on the lights and spend so much energy in creating light when it's dark. If we all had night vision, if we could all control our own temperature, we wouldn't have to change the temperature of the planet when it's cold or change it when it's hot. We wouldn't use heaters and we wouldn't use air conditioning. So instead of changing the, the, the temperature of the planet, we should be able to regulate our own temperature. So the more we design ourselves, the less we'll have to change the planet. And I think that's why we will slowly as a society see it ethical that the more we design ourselves, the less we'll have to design the planet. And this will be much better for the planet, for other species, and for ourselves. So thank you very much. And I hope you all become cyborgs very soon. Thank you.